Good morning, Bethany Community Church. We give you a warm welcome and invite you to the service this day. Before we go into the service, could we just bow our heads in prayer? Heavenly Father, I will extol you at all times. Your praises will continually be on my lips. Let us consider together Jesus and all he has done. He says to us this day, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden with problems, and I will give you rest. Things that are too heavy for yourself to carry, give to me and be at peace, for my love will carry and sustain you and bless you, for I love you all with an everlasting love, and freely give it to you as you trust and believe in me. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Enjoy the service. Bye-bye.
Hello everyone, hope you're enjoying the service. If you are, then be sure to like and subscribe for more. Sharing this content with your friends is important, and you can do so with just a few clicks. Simply go to the share button and you can share this content to any social media platform you want. Enjoy the rest of the service!
Good morning. Um, it's so good to be with you this morning, even though it's via a screen and I'm not with you in person. It's really good to be here this morning. Um, and what a week it's been. It's been this week, hasn't it? International Women's Day. And also today is Mother's Day. So it's, it's a double honor for me to be able to come and speak to you this morning. And first of all, before I start, I do want to just honor all you women in our church community who are hardworking and devoted um, to your community here and to the things that we're doing at Bethany. Um, it doesn't go unnoticed, and we want to honour you this morning. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a morning of firsts for us today as a family. So David is recording, and it's the first time he's done that. It's the first time that I've spoken to an empty room, and it's also the first time that Samuel has sat through a service, and hopefully has, will be quiet. So um, as we go on, we just um, hope that things go to plan, but I'm sure you'll bear with us if they don't. So on the news this week... On Thursday night, I was sat with David watching the 10 o'clock news, as we usually do. And um, on the news, one of the headlines was that the pandemic has um, kind of affected women more so than it's affected men, in that women have borne the brunt of homeschooling, of caring for elderly relatives and neighbours, um, looking after the house. More women than men have lost their jobs, and also more women have been furloughed. And I looked at David and I said, well, it's not really a great surprise, is it? Because that's normally the way, those are normally the things that those duties that fall to women quite often. And I'm sure in our church community that we have got lots of fantastic men and dads who have stepped up to the line and have taken their fair share of caring and homeschooling. But I know that in our church family, there are lots of women who have had a lot on their plate over the last year. And in actual fact, I know that we've got loads of super women in our congregation. So I just want to say a special uh, well done to all all of you who have been schooling and caring and working at the same time, it's really hard work. And I don't know about you, but it takes its toll, doesn't it? It's, it's tiring. The last 12 months have been tiring. And I don't think it's, it's not by accident that we are continuing our series today about well-being and how to look after ourselves. I think it's really important um, at this time to look after ourselves. And David last week was talking about how we can physically look after ourselves by getting enough sleep, what we eat, exercise. It's really important to look after our physical body. And today I'm going to be continuing our um, series about looking after our emotional health and looking after ourselves emotionally. 
There has been so much, hasn't there, on the news recently about the emotional well-being of ourselves and our children, especially especially as children have gone back to school this week and returning to school after being out of the classroom for several weeks. And as they've gone back, the drive has been, let's get our children feeling good and their emotional well-being right so that they're in a right frame of mind to learn. And it's been reported, um, hasn't it, that there has been such an increase and a surge in mental health difficulties amongst young people. So I work for um, children and adolescents mental health services. I work for the NHS and I deliver therapeutic services to children who are struggling in various ways. And we have seen an unprecedented um, surge in demand for our service and in referrals. Um, I think a study last last year claimed that there had been a 50% increase in childhood mental health issues compared to the three years previously. And I think the pandemic has certainly added to that in, in quite unprecedented ways. And as a service, when I go to work, it feels quite it feels quite overwhelming um, and it's difficult to see how current services are going to meet the demand that there is. But of course, just as we are all responsible in looking after our own physical health, we're also responsible for looking after our emotional health. And there's lots of things that we can do um, to look after ourselves. And this morning, I want it to be quite practical. It's a subject that I feel obviously quite passionate about. Um, and I want it to be quite practical. I want us to be able to go away today with a few things that mm, maybe I'll try that and I can do that to look after myself. Because as Christians, we're not immune, are we? We're not immune to the things that life throws at us. We're not immune to the difficulties, the strains and stresses of modern life. It's 100 miles per hour normally when we're not in lockdown. Um, lots of different things, lots of different hats to juggle and things to do. Um, and we're not immune to difficulties. Um, sorry. We're not immune to... Um, the things that are difficult in this world. But the difference is, the difference is that we, as, as children of God, we have access to the very wisdom of God at our disposal. We have a creator, Father God, who made us, who knows our innermost being, who knitted us together, who designed us, who knows how we tick. And he's given us all that we need to be able to live a life of godliness. He's given us the handbook for living, the Bible. He's given us his eternal living word so that we can use it. And he's wanting us to use it. And I'm not saying this morning for a moment that counseling and therapy and getting extra support is no good. Absolutely to the contrary. That's what I do. That's my job. Um, and I wholeheartedly believe in that. But I think what I want to highlight is that... Um, the bi what we know, what, what psychology and therapeutic interventions, um, what they do is they complement what we already know from the Bible, what we already know as Bible-believing Christians, what is good for us. You know, um, kind of God got there first. He's made us, he's created us, he's told us um, the best way of living. And, and in my mind, psychology is catching up with that. Um, and it complements completely what we already know. Romans tells us, doesn't it, that we have been given everything that we need for life and godliness. Um, and we, we have been called according to, um, to Jesus, according to his grace. And we've been given everything that we need through the knowledge of him for life and godliness and human flourishing. We can flourish as humans. I think as Christians, we're really best placed because we've got the maker's instructions to do things well. We're best placed to do family well. We're best placed to do marriage well. We're best placed to parent well. Um, we've been given the, the, the tools that we need to do community well and to do relationships well. So let's jump on in. Um, and have a look what the Bible has to say. So I'm going to be picking up um, from our passage. We've been looking at the life of Elijah, haven't we, um, in 1 Kings 19. So if you have your Bibles, you want to just grab them, got your tablet, your phone, pick it up, uh, scroll to 1 Kings 19. And as you get, get to the passage, I'm going to just pray. 
Father God, we pray that you would speak to us this morning, that we would have ears to hear and a heart to understand, that you would speak to us through your word, through your very living and active word, the sword of God that cuts to um, the heart of things. God, I pray that we would hear from you this morning, that we would be real, that we'd be open, that you'd use my words and you'd be with us by your Holy Spirit. Amen. So 1 Kings 19, I'm going to pick it up from... Um, verse 1, actually. Let's read this passage together. So now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So in the previous chapter, as we remember, Elijah had um, called down the fire from heaven and the rain had come and he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. He'd just done these mighty exploits for God. He'd seen the hand of God moving, but he was afraid. And when he came to Bathsheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself When today's journey into the desert, he came to a broom tree, sat down under it and prayed that he may die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and by there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord um, came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. Okay. So that's the the backdrop of what we're going to be talking about. And the first point that I've got um, of things that we can use at our disposal in our fight to maintain emotional health is to know who we are, our identity. Who are we? And to have a real deep down core sense of who we actually are. There's lots of stuff out there, isn't there, these days about who we are and our identity and how we identify identify and who we identify with and what we identify as and lot anything goes there's not a lot of truth and 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 it's kind of very whatever feels good okay there's lots of stuff isn't there about identity but as God's children as the children of God in this place at this time we hold to a thing called truth And that's quite an unpopular stance to have these days where truth is quite fluid and there's no one truth. As children of God, we believe in truth. God says, doesn't he? Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And it's vital for us to know in truth who we are. And who are we this morning? We are dearly loved, dearly loved children of the living God. I love that. You know, dearly loved children of the living God, how great the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are this morning. That is what we are. We are citizens of heaven and this world is not our home. This is not our home. This is not our final destination. We are passing through. What a difference does that truth make to our lives? If this world isn't our home, does it affect the way that we're living? Does it affect the way that we view our relationships, our time, our energy, and the things that we do? When I was young, I went, I went backpacking after my degree. I went traveling, and I took with me one bag. And if what I needed didn't fit in that bag, it wasn't going. I had to keep myself light. I needed to put it on my back. I needed to be able to move and move around quickly and go where I wanted to go. Um, I didn't want to be burdened down with having suitcases and pull-along trolleys and lots of things. I just needed one bag on my back. And it makes me think about how we're living life. Are we living burdened down with lots of cares and worries? Or are we living light so that we can go and do what God's asking us to do at the drop of a hat? Are we, are we sensitive to his spirit and what he's asking us to do? Are we living as aliens and strangers 
in this land? Does it feel strange to walk around the people that we're living amongst? Because that's what the Bible calls us. It calls us aliens and strangers. It's so important for us to know that who we are and who we belong to. The family of God. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people. You are the people of God. It's written in 1 Peter. So I like listening to podcasts quite a lot. And I've been listening over this past year in lockdown. I've been listening to a lot of podcasts um, by a guy called John Mark Comer. And he pastors a church in Portland, Oregon, Oregon in, in the U.S., and he talks about, I love it how he terms that we're apprentices of Jesus. We're learning how to disciple, how to be discipled under Jesus. And he talks a lot about human flourishing and what that means. And there was some research I was listening to last week that he mentioned that there were four things that we need to, to flourish as human beings. The first one is family. Knowing what clan, what tribe, what people group we belong to and being part of a family is really important. Having just a few friends who know us really well and actually know us and accept us and that we can be real with. The third thing was having occupation, daytime activity, which keeps us busy. And the fourth time is having a sense of purpose, knowing what we're about. And I just thought that was great. And looking at the life of Elijah... I believe he had all those things. He knew. If we look at verse 10, um, he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant and broken down your altars. They have put your prophets to death with the sword, and I am the only one left, and they're trying to kill me too. He knew that he, what people group he belonged to. He knew where his allegiance was. He knew that he was serving the Lord God Almighty, and he was zealous for God. He knew that he belonged to the Israelites. He knew that he was a servant of God. His occupation was that he was a prophet and his purpose was to prophesy. He knew he was what he was doing. He knew where he was about. He knew that his purpose on this world was to love God and to make him known. And it's nothing different for us, is it? To love God, to know God and to make him known to the world around us. So how do we remember who, that, who we are? How do we keep in our heads a sense of who we are when there are so many conflicting things around and in the world and lots of pulls on our time and our resources, and lots of hats for us to wear? How do we remember who we are in God? Well, I think it's really important to speak it out, to speak truth over ourselves, to remind ourselves of who we are. And I think Elijah did that. He spoke out, didn't he, later on? And he said, I have been zealous for the Lord God Almighty. I've been zealous. This is who I am. This is what I do. I think we need to speak out truth over ourselves. And it's something that I try as a discipline to do um, with my children, either before they go to bed or before they go to school. Um, sometimes I don't, and I, then I try and get back into it. But as a, as a mum, I try and speak some truth into their life so that they know deep down in their core who they are. So it might go something like, on the way to school, I might say, Levi, have a great, have a, have a great day at school. Remember, you are brave, you are courageous, you are strong, and you have Almighty God with you. I might say to Samuel, you know, have a great day at school, Samuel. Know that you're blessed and you're a blessing everywhere you go. Just speaking truth all the time. And we can do that with each other, can't we? Telling each other, you're the head. You're the head and not the tail. You're the above and not the beneath. You know, you are salt and light. You are called to be a blessing wherever you go. You are set apart for righteousness. You know, you're a megas. You're a megas and you're set apart for righteousness. Because I think it's so important if we don't speak truth, I think we hear things from elsewhere, don't we? And other people will tell us and tell our kids who they are and what they are and, and different things that we know aren't true, you know? We've got to saturate them with the truth. And when I, when I talk about the, our children, I'm not just meaning children in, in our own family, our own children, as a community of people, 
as a community of, of people of God, we've got responsibility to raise the next generation, to be an example, to model to them true discipleship and apprenticeship under Jesus, and to speak truth into the life of all the children in our community. That's all our responsibility, whether or not we serve in the kids' church, or we have kids in our family, or we're grandparents, or whatever. You know, we're, we're part of a family because we're part of church. And so being able to speak truth into the next generation's lives is so important. It's so important. And to speak truth into into each other's lives as adults, to, to speak truth over each other and, and tell each other what is true. So that's my first point. Okay, my second point is about disappointment. Because even though we're Christians and we belong to this amazing family of God and we've got a Father God, it doesn't mean that we're immune to things that will happen to us. It doesn't mean that we won't face disappointment. And we certainly, if you haven't already, you will face disappointment in this life. We're told, aren't we, um, that in this world you will have trouble. It's not when, it's not maybe, it's you will have trouble. But trust in me, I have overcome the world, Jesus says. But when trouble comes, it can feel bitterly, bitterly disappointing, can't it? I remember, it must be about 12 years ago now, David was the assistant minister. It was his first assistant role in the church in Yeovil. And we'd been married several years, um, and we were struggling to have children. And it was a battle that we, we had at that time. And I remember confiding in one of the older ladies in church about some of the struggles and the disappointments that we'd had along in that journey. And she said to me, and she was ever so nice and well-meaning, um, but she said to me, you know, we just got to carry on, Katie, because as we know, God never disappoints us. And I kind of just smiled at her and moved on. But inside, inside, everything was wanting to scream out, but I am disappointed. I'm so disappointed. I'm bitterly disappointed. And that was my, that was me being real. And in that moment with her, I wasn't real because I smiled and moved on. But inside, I was really disappointed. Um, I was disappointed that we had left our home and our home church. We were newly married. We'd left our lovely first home and we'd gone to Bible college to obey the call of God on our lives. We had landed. We'd lived through three years of, of Bible college and, and all that, that that brought. We'd gone, we'd landed in the middle of nowhere. We were pursuing God's call and we couldn't have children. And I was bitterly disappointed. I wanted God to answer this desire and this prayer that we had and I was really disappointed and that was the truth and I think Elijah the life of Elijah shows us that that's that's normal he was disappointed too he was really disappointed in verse 4 we read that um, he came to a broom tree sat down under it and prayed that he might die I have had enough he said I've had enough take my life I am no better than my ancestors. Take my life, God. Now, I have never been that disappointed where I have asked God to take my life, but I know some people who have. I know that, that for some people that's been really real. And, and it's great, isn't it? Because the Bible has examples of people who are real and who, who show us that these are raw emotions that we can have. You know, he's just prayed down fire from heaven and the rain of heaven has come after that. And he's still disappointed and he feels that he's no good and he wants to die it's real isn't it and there's lots of examples aren't there in the bible of people who have real emotions and i think we need to be real about there's actually a there's actually a book isn't there devoted to lament we need to lament sometimes and recognize the realness of our emotions lamentation 317 I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is, so I say my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped for from the Lord. We know David wrestled with strong emotions, don't we? Job, the churning inside me never stops. Days of suffering confront me. My lyre is tuned to mourning and my pipe to the sound of wailing. These are real emotions and it is definitely, there is definitely a time and a place for mourning, grieving and lament and I don't think as a culture if I'm being honest I don't think that we do it particularly well and maybe that's something that we need to learn to be real with how we're feeling and expressing that 
Elijah had lost all hope. And I think that's the key here, isn't it? He lost all hope. Hope so important, isn't it? Hope so important to keep us going. You know, like countless studies have shown that people who have faced real harsh adversities, it's hope that keeps us going. Without a heavenly perspective, I would go further to say, without a heavenly perspective of things, knowing what comes at the end, hope can be difficult to see. Without a heavenly perspective, hope can be difficult to grasp hold of. I didn't know before I had children that I eventually would have two and God would work a way for that to happen and that I would have two. I didn't know God's plan. I didn't see the end. Elijah didn't know that when he sat under that tree wanting to die, that God eventually would appoint Elisha and appoint and would raise up new kings and that there would be a different ending to the good story. Jonah didn't know that when he was in the belly of a fish, he didn't know God's heart for the people of Nineveh, that they would repent and come back to God and that would satisfy God's heart. David didn't know that when he fell and sinned with Bathsheba, that God would restore him. Job didn't know that he would be restored and that all would be restored to him more than it was before. But disciples, when they were grieving the death of Jesus and they were scared in the upper room, not knowing what was going to happen next, they didn't know that death was not the end, that there was a different story and God was working it all out. God would be raising Jesus from the dead. He would be their hope and their glory. But, you know, they did know, the disciples, didn't they? They later on went on, many of them, to be martyred. And they knew when they were being martyred because God doesn't always intervene in this life the way that we want him to. He doesn't always answer our prayers the way that we want him to in this life. And sometimes we have to wait to the next life to see the answering of that. But the disciples, when they were facing death, many of them in in awful ways, they knew They had hope. They knew that death wasn't the end. They had a sure, eternal, living hope who was Jesus, who had conquered death and sin and hell and the disappointment of this world. They had a sure and living hope that when Jesus comes again, he would put all things right, that he would restore all things, he would wipe every tear away, he would put all things right. Where would we be today with the disappointments of this world if it wasn't for Jesus? I don't know how we could go on in in many situations if we didn't have him. Thank God for Jesus, hey? Where would we be without him? We see also in the book of Lamentations that lament doesn't last forever. It comes to an end. Lamentations 3, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions, they never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. There comes a change. And there came a change in the life of Elijah. In verses 7 and 8, we read, The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he was strengthened. There was a change. Elijah got up. He didn't stay lying down under the tree waiting and wanting to die. He got up. He acted contrary to how he was feeling. He wanted to stay there lying down and dying, but he got up. He did something different. And in the therapy, one of the therapies that I deliver at work to the young people that I see, we call this acting opposite, acting opposite to how we feel. Our feelings are really deceptive sometimes, and we shouldn't act on our feelings most of the time. And we call it acting opposite um, or acting from the outside in, not the inside out. And that's exactly what Elijah did. He must have been in one of my therapy sessions. He knew that to act from the outside in was the best thing to do. And that's what God knows is the best for us sometimes, isn't it? Elijah got up and and the act of getting up, even though he didn't want to, changed things, changed things completely. And I think one of the ways that we can get up and act opposite to how we feel is by being thankful. Being thankful is often when we're so disappointed and we've had a period of being distressed. Being thankful is sometimes the last thing that we want to be, but being thankful is sometimes the best thing we can be. And thankfulness and gratitude is my next point. 
And it's one of the tools, the last um, point that we can, that I've got to talk about is one of the, the tools that we've got to look after our emotional well-being. There has been a huge resurgence recently, of recent years, about gratitude. It's become quite a thing. And there's even a therapy now called Gratitude Therapy, um, which you can find out about. And in 2016, it was hailed as the next psychotherapeutic craze. Okay, So being thankful and, and, and having gratitude was, as, was discovered as a new therapy. So what research has discovered um, about being thankful is that there's loads of benefits to it, absolutely loads of benefits to our own health of being thankful. So it decreases um, depression, it decreases anxiety, it strengthens our relationships, it improves our mental health and, our, and decreases our stress levels, it aids our sleep, it increases our energy, and it reduces blood pressure. Loads and loads of benefits from being thankful. It has long-lasting and um, positive effects. And they found the neuroscience of thankfulness is that they found that when we're thankful, that, that um, dopamine is released um, into our brains, which is the chemical that makes us feel good. So it, it's being thankful. There's lots of research and, and scientific fact that it's, that it's good for us. Who'd have thought? I love it because it's like God knew about it first. And that's how he's told us to be, isn't it? And he's, and he's kind of knows that that's really good for us because he's created us. And I just love it how God knows that. As Christians, um, we have been practicing the latest psychotherapeutic craze for years. And we didn't even know. You know, from the beginning of time, God's people have been told to be a thankful people. Now, if you were all here this morning, and I wasn't looking at you via um, a screen, if you were all here in the auditorium, I am sure that if I asked you to shout out um, verses from Scripture about giving thanks, you would be able to just keep them coming at me, firing, firing them at me. We know, don't we, in Psalms, we're told to rejoice in the Lord always. We're told to come before him with thanksgiving. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And one of my favorites is Philippians 4, isn't it? Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Present your requests to God and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, given what we know about research, about Thanksgiving, that it helps us to sleep, it reduces our anxiety. We've been told, haven't we, in Philippians, exactly what it does. Don't be anxious. But in everything, give thanks, present your requests, and the peace of God will transcend all all your understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. It's no wonder that we sleep better when we're a thankful people because it's, it fixes our head, our, our mind, on the things that God has done. He's been faithful in the past. He's been good to us in the past, and he'll be good to us in the future. He's in control. He's got it all He's got it all in his hand. He's, he's, he's in charge. He's the boss. He knows us. He's got us. We don't have to toss and, and turn and be anxious and worried because God's got it. God's got it and we're told that in scripture. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful. Be overflowing with thankfulness, devoted to being a thankful people. Remember what we said about walking in the opposite spirit, doing the opposite of how we feel. When we're discontent, when we're restless, when we're anxious, when we don't know what to do next, being thankful is often the, the, the best anecdote to all of those feelings. Concentrating on what we have and what God has given us rather than what we don't have and what God has not given us. It increases our optimism, increases our energy and increases our empathy for the community of people around us. It's, it's amazing stuff and God has, has laid that out for us. Research, again, from John Mark Homer that I heard on my, my podcast this week is that thankful people are the most joyful people. Thankful people are the most joyful people. And who doesn't want to be a joyful person? Who doesn't want to be around joyful people? Right now, I'm looking at this blank auditorium and there's no one sat here, but I can see the people in my mind's eye who I think are joyful people. I can see them smiling back at me now. And I think you probably know who you are, but you know, we have so many joyful people. Who doesn't want to be a joyful person? 
So how can we develop, just in the last few minutes, how can we develop um, a culture of thankfulness in our, in our homes, in our lives, in our family, in our community as a group of people? Loads of different ways, um, corporately and individually, that we can do there. Just, just a few um, things that we can do to give thanks to God. We can keep a prayer journal, can't we? We can make our, our request known, and then we can go back over that and see what God has done for us. We're so fickle, aren't we, in a way, as, as humans, that we don't often remember the good times um, you know where our brains are programmed um, to to look out for danger and to remember um, bad things more than they remember good things there's actually um, something about how our brains uh, um, are wired so that we scan for danger and we notice danger and we remember um, distressing memories more than we remember happy memories so we need to kind of commit to be quite um purposeful in committing good things to memory you know and taking time to do that and writing them down uh, for, you know is a really good way of doing that it might be that having something in your kitchen a gratitude jar things that you can just pop in write on a bit of paper or put a pebble in something that you want to thank god for each day as a family in our house we've got a blessing book to be honest we don't use it as much as we should I can see it now on our kitchen table and we haven't picked it up for a while. We need to probably do that tonight, don't we? Look at our blessing book and see how, and write down in there how God has blessed us. Sometimes when we're having lunch or when we're going for a walk um, and the kids are squabbling, I'll say, right, three things we can thank God for, both of you. And they've got to go and, and tell me three things. We've all got to name three things we can say thank you to God for. Walking in the opposite spirit of how we're feeling. If they're squabbling, let's get the opposite going. Sending cards, gifts, texts to people. It's encouraged to be, it's important to encourage each other, isn't it? And to be thankful for each other and to let each other know that we appreciate them, that we honor them. We honor um, things that people are doing in our midst. I'm thankful for good friends. I'm thankful for good friends who model to me how to be a good disciple of Jesus and I can walk in their ways. My good friend Esther, who she actually came and spoke uh, a few years ago at the women's conference here. She um, put on Facebook just a memory this week of when she lost her husband. Um, she was widowed early on and she was left with four young children. And her husband died three weeks before Father's Day. And she knew that as Father's Day approached, this was going to be a really pivotal day in their lives as a family. She knew that how she approached this and how she dealt with Father's Day was going to set the tone for them as a family in the years to come. And what she wanted to do, what her feelings were telling her, it was, you know, obviously three weeks raw emotion. She just wanted to curl up in a ball and not deal with Father's Day and let it pass them by. But she knew that that would set a tone for her and her family. So she sat the kids down and together they made a list of all the men that were still in their lives who encouraged them and helped them. And all the men um, who were in their lives who they were thankful for. So rather than thinking about the things that the, 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 the man that they'd lost and being ungrateful for, for, for all that they'd lost. They concentrated, they made a conscious effort to decide to be thankful for all the things, for all the men that they still had. And they wrote cards um, and they sent them to the men in their lives. And that was a pivotal moment. She, she writes about in, in, and talks about how that change it how it set the course for them as a family to have a new mindset of thankfulness um and i just think that's that's fantastic it's again it's acting opposite to how we feel sometimes and according to what we know is right and according to the maker's instructions to to how god has has told us is what's good for us Okay, so just a few things this morning that we've talked about. Obviously, there are lots of other things that we can do to look after our emotional well-being, but that's just a few things. So we've looked at identity. We've looked at knowing who we are in God, who we are as children of the living God and what that means for our life and how we can speak truth, speak truth over each other and over our own lives. We've looked at disappointment and pain and how we deal with that. And there's a time for lament and a time for grieving. And also a time for getting up and for doing the opposite of how we feel. There's a time for being thankful, for acting according to truth and not feelings, and knowing the hope 
to which we have been called, to knowing the truth to which we have been called and walking in it. This is the way, walk in it. Let's do that together as a community, as we journey through this life together as a family. Let's encourage each other. Let's honour and love each other deeply as we do this together. Thank you, Jesus. I pray that you would um, speak to each one of us, that you would show us the way to go. You would highlight things in our lives that we can put in place that are ultimately going to help us to help ourselves and help each other. We pray that you would, by your spirit, just help us to keep thinking and mulling things over, maybe things that you'd want us to do. We thank you that you uh, love us, that you have what's best for us in mind, that you're our father, that you are our creator, and that we can trust you, and that you are our sure and living hope. We thank you for Jesus. Amen.
Oh